Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode four. I'm going to be the tans, uh, you know, reds. So I'd say there are a lot of warms and not as many cools. So that kind of helps me know what direction I would like to push this painting. And so warmth and, and coolness of a painting are a contrast. And it's great to have both, uh, but you want one to be a winner. So you don't want to have a war going on. I talk a lot about this. Um, when you're stuck in a painting, it's usually because there's a war going on between some of your design elements, one or more of them. Okay, so I'm going to use this um, golden nickel azo quinacridone gold. So there you can kind of see that the label is quite messed up uh, because I use this a lot. And what I'm going to do, instead of mixing it on my palette, I kind of want to dilute it a little bit. So I've got this airbrush medium here another uh, container that's um, quite messed up, but you can hear how liquid this is. So I'm not just gonna add water, I'm actually gonna put some of this on my painting. And now where I scored those lines and any place that I've abraded the surface, uh, any place there's kind of a little edge, that's where the glaze is gonna collect because I'm gonna actually remove a lot of this. So what I'm gonna do first is just mix it with my gloved hand. So I've already diluted it with that airbrush medium. And I'm going to kind of just move it around. You can move it around with a paper towel or whatever you want, but uh, the main thing is to, to kind of cover the entire surface with this one glaze. Now edges where I have sanded, uh, they are going to, you know, probably pick up a bit more of this color unless I locked it in with that gloss medium which was the last step I did. So notice how it's, <laughs> when you put on a glaze, what happens is the darks get lighter and the lights get darker because you're just adding this color to it. And so I'm kind of just observing at first. Uh, but I also know that I'm gonna remove most of this glaze. So I'm just moving it around with my hand here. And now I'm gonna grab a paper towel. I'm actually gonna just dampen it a little bit with some water because now I wanna remove much of this glaze. I wanna show you what it looks like first. It looks like a bit of a disaster, but the main thing is that the glaze gives the painting harmony. So now I'm gonna just rub it back. And now I've got an umbrella of color, this nickel azo quinacridone gold, and it's really um, harmonized the painting. But it's also done a few other things. It's made my lights a little darker and my darks a little lighter. And so whenever that happens, you don't have to panic. That's completely normal and expected part of, um, you know, uh, being successful with the glaze is to, to know what to expect. Now I can continue to take a little bit more off. I can also repeat the glazing process if that wasn't enough. Um, so I just took off a little bit more but there are several areas where it has sunk in, like into the crevices a little bit more, where I had those diagonal lines, you can kind of see. And um, I might have to put, you know, like another layer of this on there, but um, on the other hand, you know, the degree of harmony is um, kind of up to you how much you want on there. And I can also glaze over any areas that are really like feeling like, wow, they're really not harmonious. Like, let's say the blue is a problem. You can certainly spot glaze. You don't have to glaze over the entire thing. But now what I want to do is um, it's, it's really mid-tone with some dark here, here, and there. So I'm definitely looking at my values here. And I'm looking for like further ways. Do I, do I need to calm this down? Where do I need to calm it down? Uh, what, what, what do I need to do in order to calm it down? Uh, what are my areas of interest? And this being the original slot port here has a lot of interest and it's close to a high contrast area. So one thing to make this a little bit more high contrast is to add some white to that little piece of scrapbook paper that had a letter on it. And I love typography, I love letters. So that for me would be like a kind of a no brainer. Let's do that. You just wanna to start to do uh, things that speak to you. Like what's the first thing you can do um, to move your painting forward? Like what's the most obvious thing you can do first? What's kind of the no brainer? 
And you just start with one thing at a time. Um, rather than looking at it as, oh, I've got so many things I've got to do, you just don't know how even doing one thing is going to impact the rest of your painting. So right now I'm just taking some white paint and I'm going to amp up, meaning increase the value of this little letter here. I need to be kind of careful because I want it to read just like it did before as this letter. So I'm making this letter lighter in value, which just means I'm increasing contrast between the letter and its background. And that will definitely attract the eye more because the eye is always looking for areas of highest contrast. We tend to see the value of color before we see color itself. And so what I'm doing here is I am increasing contrast. Notice how that letter S now kind of jumps out at you. And we have to be kind of careful um, where, you know, because it's a tool. Uh, the, the tool of contrast is something you can pull out of your back pocket anytime. Um, but you need to use it, you know, kind of wisely. And um, you, you tend to want to place the areas of highest contrast where you want the eye to go. So it's a tool, right? And uh, we artists have these uh, toolboxes of our uh, favorite things that we do. But um, most often, the most powerful things we can do have to do with um, understanding uh, whether it's high contrast, whether it's harmonized, unified, whether there's rhythm or repetition and variation. And um, these are all things that we talk about with um, you know, design and color. So just know that everything I'm doing, um, like what's guiding me is my understanding of color and design. And like two decades ago, I just couldn't have done this. I, I would, I had fear and I couldn't move forward. I'd be like, no, let's, I think I'll quit while I'm ahead because I might ruin it, you know? And that was just such a bummer. Like I, I didn't like that limitation. I felt limited. Um, whereas if you take that time to really establish your foundations, then you've built your house on concrete. And you're essentially going to be able to build any house on top of your concrete foundation that you want. You'll be able to explore any style that you want, and you'll still know that it's you. Because you'll know, you know, again, if you spend that time on you know, what makes you personally different from everybody else, uh, no matter what you're exploring, parts of you are going to, to show. And you're never going to worry about copying another artist because you can't. Um, I share my what I do because I know nobody can copy me. I can't copy me. Uh, and that, that's actually just fine. So uh, now uh, collage paper, um, it's never too late uh, on an acrylic painting to add more collage material. And in this case, I've got tracing paper where I've drawn a line with an acrylic, you know, pen type thing and it's dry. I'm being very specific here and you don't have to be this way, but again, uh, you've got a choice, right? Like you can just plaster that collage paper down and there it is. Or in this case, I'm uh, going to a lot of trouble actually to find like what size circle should I uh, make it as far as like the, the outline of it. And then do I want a diagonal on the, uh, like a hard edge there? Yes. So I'm using my ruler and then I'm going to cut it out. You know, I'm going to a lot of trouble to fit this piece into the painting and that's a choice. So um, I look at painting, uh, and you guys, I'm sure, do too as well, but it, it's just a ton of choices, kind of like when you're driving a car. I just remember some statistic, when you're driving a car at any one moment, you are making like so many decisions at any one time. So painting is very much like that, constantly making decisions. Um, do I go warm or cool? Um, do I put in some, you know, geometry? Do I, do I want chaos versus calm? And I guess that's what makes art so challenging. And I'd love to know what make what you guys feel is like really challenging you in your art. Like what's the biggest challenge that you love? Like, is there a challenge you really love because it's, um, it's fun, it's hard work, but you always feel good when you've met that challenge. I think for all of us, we have something, right? But the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, it's okay. It's even, you know, just good, but oftentimes, uh, that's what happens when you give yourself or your painting time to settle in with you. I mean, it was still kind of new to me when I created it, right? And it was still kind of just a, um, I needed time to think about, can I, should I push this more? I mean, from a design standpoint, I'll show you the black and white. Here it is. 
and uh, it, it could be done, right? Because for me, the value pattern is strong, but I don't have like at this point, um, a feeling of like, it is me, it's my personal voice and all that, but can I do better? And then do I feel an emotion coming from this? And while I love a lot of things that are in here, like, you know, dots and some geometry and pattern and, you know, all those things are in here, some text, it has all the things I love. So why is it that I don't feel more strongly about this painting and just say it's done? And again, I think that paintings can be done at many stages of their life. But the harder thing to do is to really um, give your painting time and do some major soul searching, right? Like, I think each of us knows inside of us whether we can actually push something further. And although that may seem risky, like, why not quit, to, quit while I'm ahead? Why should I push this painting forward? Uh, what if I ruin it, right? Uh, but the more you understand color and design, you're, you're just not going to have that worry ever. Like, I don't have that worry because I know that um, there is no risk. There's no risk um, of me not being able to finish this painting. The only uh, risk is that I don't push it far enough because that's where the growth comes from. If you want growth, then number one, it, it really does, uh, it's to your advantage to have a strong foundation in color and design because that's what gives you the confidence to push a painting further than where you might normally stop. And I caught myself, I was like ready to just, I had this in a frame and I thought, oh, well, it, it's okay, it's good. And I hate to say it, but it would probably sell. But that's not enough. Like, you know, the longer you paint, the, the more you realize that it's not just about being okay with something or being good with it or even selling it. Um, no, um, art asks you to do more. Your art asks you to do more. And so I decided that I would push this painting forward. It's a Saturday and I, I will see you on Monday. Uh, I'm gonna work on this and I am going to move this into cold wax and oil simply because of all the times that I've done that, there's a certain quality that I'm after that I, I have not been able to really obtain with just acrylic. It's not that I don't love my just acrylic paintings, but I found that when I uh, start with something like this, which, you know, let's face it, it'd be hard to do this particular design in just cold wax and oil. It would have taken me a long, long time to say, come up with this dotted pattern and, and this kind of text and this little letter S here, and even like this, right? These are things that the medium does not readily allow you to do. So what if you like this, but you want to go further? So that's one reason why in my own process over many, many years, lots and lots of painting that I've realized that what the acrylic process allows you to do, especially if you're a cold wax and oil artist, is just get some paint down and start to move yourself toward what you love. But the final touch is if you then transition into oil and cold wax, you get a certain surface quality and you add value to your painting as well. Again, as much as I don't like to talk about what collectors are looking for, um, a painting that you can say, you know, is, is, is oils, right? Has a higher perceived value. And I only share this with you because if you are a professional artist and if you do show in galleries, from my experience, that is just, it's just a fact, right? Acrylics are um, certainly sellable. People commission you to do it. But for those artists who go the step further and convert it into an oil and cold wax painting, there is a higher perceived value. And the reason for that is that oils are more expensive and there are some technical things you need to know to work in this medium. Now that that's not to say that uh, um, I don't feel very strongly about just 100% acrylic work, because I do. I am telling you what um, my experience from collectors has been and galleries and just looking at prices of other people's work. I feel like it, it, it's important for us to know uh, what we're dealing with here. For those of you who want to make a living safe from your art, and uh, as my work sells and I see, you know, like, well, what are, what are people interested in? It's not that that's really going to affect me because I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. But I do in the back of my mind realize that a painting that's started with acrylic and then covered with oil and cold wax 
is valued higher and my prices are higher. But beyond that, like way more important than that is that the reason why I started doing that was because I liked the result better. So that's the most important reason for doing it. Um, and so I'm going to take this painting and I'm going to keep going with it. The value pattern um, is what it is right now. It's predominantly mid-tone. I'd say it has uh, secondary darks, like this is a very dark area. This guy is dark. There's some dark up here. But the light, this is high key and it's a, um, a white. And this up here is also pretty white. So there's only very little... Uh, lights in this painting, but I'm, I'm just going to totally change the value pattern because I want more from this painting. So that's the first thing I realized. It's not, it's, it's good. It's not great. I want this to be a great painting and great for me does not mean it's going to be great for you. It means it's going to be great for me. And only I can answer that question. I could ask you guys what you think of it. And 10% of you might say, great, love it. 10% might say, gosh, I hate it. My three-year-old could do it. The majority of you might say, I don't care. <laughs> Ultimately, my personal voice does not is not dependent on what the public thinks. And that's where I love every artist to get to. Like, you know, you need to kind of shut out the world, social media, um, all these likes that we get. Like, they don't really amount to a hill of beans because we personally know deep down inside how we really feel and that the role that social media plays is trying to uh, give you either comfort when it's good, when it's good feedback, sure, we feel good, right? When it's bad feedback, some of us feel really badly. That is sad. And it's sad because you as an artist have such a gift to be you. And when you get negative feedback or negative comments, it doesn't mean your work is really bad. It just means that people disagree with you. And that, if anything, if you really have put your heart and soul into it and you have strong design, which, you know, again, I think that's what gives you this coat of armor, uh, who doesn't want that? So that negative commentary can bounce off of you like water off a duck's back. But that took me a long time to get to that point. But now that I'm at that point, I really do feel rather bulletproof. And that's something I talk about in my Art and Success Master's course, 